Welcome back, everyone. We're here today on our Training Thursday episode. Today, we're going to be talking about the five ways to naturally boost nitric oxide. We'll go over what nitric oxide is, why it should matter to you, and why it gets depleted as we age. Really important because if you're not producing enough nitric oxide, you're also more prone to what are called endothelial issues, which is basically the lining of your blood vessels, and it can lead to heart disease, right? Cardiovascular vascular disease, number one killer in the world. Then we have blood pressure-based issues. We don't want that. The hardening of the arteries, the stenosis that can lead to blood pressure, um, diabetes, and many other issues. So again, keep in mind nitric oxide does matter. We're able to boost it naturally, which is amazing, through nutrition, exercise, et cetera, but very specifically. So I want to share with you how to do that, five specific ways today. And I'm also going to link up a really great article on it. So again, I like I say, I always like to give credit where credit is due. And this one was written by uh, Masters in Science, registered dietitian, Gavin Van De Waal. All right, Gavin Van De Waal, just written a couple months ago. And um, someone actually sent me in this specific little article, this resource. And I was like, oh, this is very succinct. It's nicely done. So Gavin, great article. I want to share with you this information and um, basically see if I can break it down to a practice-based standpoint from an integrative health standpoint and how you're able to then optimize it for your own health. And I'll link this up. So all the links will be at stephencabral.com forward slash 2505. Uh, one of the reasons why this article is really nice is there's somewhere around 50, 44 to be specific, medical citations. So not too bad at all. All right, so let's take it right from the top. Nitric oxide is a molecule that's produced naturally by your body. It's used in many health aspects. And what it does, it allows for what's called vasodilation. Why does that matter? What is vasodilation? This is something we've talked about on the podcast many, many times. Vasodilation is an expansion of our blood vessels, of our arteries. It allows blood to flow through the body very, very easily. And vasoconstriction is when everything begins to tighten up, right? So think about like in Raynids where people have um, the discoloration of the fingers, cold hands and cold feet. And a lot of that is from sympathetic nervous system dominance and stress. So as we produce more norepinephrine and stress hormones in our body, the capillaries and all the blood flow to these tiny little vessels becomes much more constricted. And when that happens, well, we can't bring the warm blood, the oxygen to our fingertips and our toes and even the tip of our nose. And it starts to maybe turn a little bit more purple um, and it feels cold to the touch. A lot of people with thyroid have a lot of slower um, circulation as well. I've talked about that just a couple weeks ago on thyroid-based symptoms. And again, if you want to take any of my free quizzes to see if you have any of these symptoms, Symptoms, you can just go to stephencabral.com forward slash assessments. All right, but nitric oxide is extremely important for overall blood flow. It brings nutrients to the different areas of your body and allows oxygen to travel throughout your body as well. Oxygen, extremely important because it also helps to squelch overall levels of inflammation and free radical damage. So some of the common issues that you see with low nitric oxide production um, oftentimes can be allergies, asthma, it can even be sometimes headaches because it can work in reverse as well, heart disease, blood pressure issues, uh, dementia-based issues, lots of inflammation in the body, and uh, erectile dysfunction in men. So what we like to do in our practice is just understanding that as you get older, you're typically producing less nitric oxide. But like anything in life, you're able to keep it going through life if you do the things that maybe you didn't do when you were younger, but that have been scientifically proven to continue to keep this, um, a lot of people call it the miracle molecule going, right? Because again, if you have nitric oxide flowing in your body, it means that you have great oxygenation, great vasodilation, which means you're probably gonna have more energy, less brain fog. And that's uh, what I think many of us do want. All right, so the first recommendation is to eat vegetables high in nitrates. Now, I am so the thing that this article doesn't do is give you the bio individual bio individuality aspect. I don't know why I have such a difficult time saying that over the last few days. So bio individuality is basically what's good for one individual is not good for another, right? And typically it falls somewhere in the middle. So like let's take example for me. I don't do well with nightshades. Never have done well with nightshade based vegetables. Think peppers and tomatoes and potatoes, et cetera. 
I just don't do well with them. It creates inflammation in my body. My body does not break down those nutrients uh, from the vegetables. I might consider them tomato, fruit, et cetera, very well. So here's the thing, though. Once I got my body totally healthy, I eliminated those foods. It did, that was not, obviously not the thing that got me well. It's just one of the things, right, understanding my body, is that I can now eat nightshades again. Now I have the same genetics. What I can't do though is overdo nightshades because then yeah, it will cause an issue. It's the rain barrel effect, right? That little book right over there, the rain barrel effect, yeah. So I talk about that. Once your rain barrel is basically empty, you can get away with doing a lot more. All right, the same goes for nitrates. Nitrites, nitrates, a lot of people have an issue with them. It gives them headaches, skin rashes, migraines, uh, inflammation, and much more. So what we need to do, though, is figure out, well, why, are, is our, why is our rain barrel so full? Is it food sensitivities? Is it gut permeability? Is it candida overgrowth? Is it SIBO, H. pylori, parasites, heavy metals, viruses? Like, there's so many things that it could be, right? Environmental pollutants, lack of sleep. So anyway, what I'm saying is that some of these good, going overboard, not so good. So like celery is the first one. So, you know, there has been the the craze over the last couple of years of celery juicing. It's starting to quiet down now a little bit, but they couldn't produce. They couldn't grow enough celery, right? It's unbelievable. Well, celery is loaded with nitrates, loaded with nitrates. And a lot of people have really poor reactions to using celery juice. I've talked about this before. And the problem is when one thing is recommended for everyone, a lot of people get harmed by that. Now, can some people benefit? Of course, Absolutely. You've got your natural salts and potassium and celery. Great electrolyte right there, right? You're also juicing it, so you're getting hydration. And then you're getting the nitric oxide that can be produced from the nitrates. So a lot of people benefited, but then a lot of people didn't. And the people who didn't were told that they weren't doing it right. Now, again, that's, that's unfair, right? They were doing it right. It just didn't work for their body. So that's why as practitioners uh, and even the, the general public, I want us to be a little gentler when people say that it's not working for them. Like, we want to go deeper. Well, what might not be working for you, okay? So, like, again, that's why we have to be careful when uh, recommendations are given out online by people that are not sharing both sides, all right? I just try to give a fair and balanced approach. That's all. All right. Other ones as well, uh, as well, lettuce, beets have always been a great one for producing nitric oxide. Like you want a nice juice or a little uh, vegetable juice shot before a workout, juice a full beet, you know, take that right down, a lot of nitric oxide production. Spinach is another, arugula is another great one as well. All right, so those are great at producing nitric oxide. I enjoy a little arugula with uh, dinner oftentimes. That'll be a salad or, or some that I'll have on the side. Really, really nice uh, as well. All right, so for me, I don't overdo uh, high nitrate vegetables. I really don't. I'll do some beets. I love beets. The red beets are going to produce more than nitric oxide. I happen to like the yellow beets, the rainbow beets a little bit more. But I do not do great with super high nitrate foods. So you're not going to catch me juicing celery. And um, again, if it works for you, phenomenal. I have no issues with that. I get it. Phenomenal. I don't do that. I do smoothies instead, and it works great for my body. Okay, so that's that. Um, again, a lot of people just don't do well with those sodium nitrates. The next one is this, antioxidants. This is what I do a lot of. I'm a big believer in this because when I look at the blue zones, when I look at the longest lived people, they're taking in high antioxidant foods. Like the longest lived people in o Okinawa eat uh, a purple potato. It's an Okinawan purple potato. And it is unbelievably high in antioxidants and phytonutrients and something called anthocyanins. This isn't in the article, but again, I'm giving you my take on all this. Um, just keep in mind, antioxidants are the brightly colored fruits and vegetables. So when people are telling you not to eat fruits and vegetables, again, it's so short-sighted. It really is. It's like body transformation-based, great. So you've got six-pack abs. But I don't want you to die in your mid-60s with six-pack abs, okay? I don't know. Maybe that's someone's goal. I just think that you should be in great shape uh, for your body, uh, in your body alone and live a long time as well in good health. And you need antioxidants, okay? And you're gonna get those from brightly colored fruits and vegetables. Uh, there are things like vitamin C, vitamin E. Uh, they're gonna help produce like the uh, green vegetables, like the cruciferous ones are gonna help produce glutathione, which is a naturally powerful antioxidant produced in your liver. And so it's super important right there. All right, so I do a lot of that every day. Seven to nine cups of fruits and vegetables. I do typically around two cups of uh, fruit, sometimes three, and uh, mainly berries. Uh, but not all. I use some banana and other th items in there as well. And then I get uh, about five to six cups of vegetables per day. So I'm right at that nine typically per day. 
All right. Uh, so again, I, I do a lot of that. I use the daily fruit and vegetable blend for additional antioxidants. And, uh, and that's about it. Uh, and then again, vitamin C, quercetin, all those items I take as supplements. Uh, I'll, let me talk about that next. So a lot of people use nitric oxide precursors such as L-arginine and uh, L-citrulline. So here's how I use those in my practice and I barely ever use them. But L-citrulline I will use, and again, I'm not giving any medical advice, with high blood pressure. L-citrulline can become L-arginine. So it's like, it's a, it's an easy downflow. It's kind of like EPA becoming DHA for omega-3s. It's easy. No, no issues there. Your body can convert it. L-arginine though is for a lot of, a lot of people use that before a workout to help improve oxygen and the pump, right, in the gym. So those are things that you can do. Uh, uh, there's the uh, L-arginine NO pathway. When you hear NO, it's just you know, nitric oxide. Uh, I don't use a lot of those supplements. I actually don't use any. But again, like in your 20s or so, like a lot of people do use them and a lot of bodybuilders use them. Uh, but it's not something I use. I look at things from a clinical perspective. Um, I will use L-citrulline. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but just because it's going to allow for more NO and more circulation and improving that. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, what I use for antioxidants though are things like Histpro. That's one of my favorites. So it's going to have vitamin C and it's going to have quercetin in them. Very powerful antioxidants. Those help to squelch free radical damage and free radicals destroy nitric oxide. So in a roundabout kind of way, you're making more nitric oxide because you're allowing it to stay in your bloodstream longer. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, this was an interesting one. So this was one that... I learned from this article. And I never even thought about it. So I always love to, to share what I'm learning as well. So I don't use mouthwash. I know a lot of people do. I certainly do oil pulling. I have no issues with that. I think it's fantastic. It's obviously been taught for 6,000 years in Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, but mouthwash, which a lot of people do use, kills bacteria in the month, in, in the mouth, which is why you get more fresh breath. The problem is it may not last that long because it kills, it kills good bacteria as well. And I learned that many years ago not to use mouthwash like a Listerine or a Scope, et cetera, because the alcohol is actually going to destroy the good bacteria in your mouth. And you don't want that because it's terrible for your gums. It's terrible for the enamel on your teeth. Uh, it's terrible for cavities. Like it's not good. Oil pulling is much better. And then just brushing and flossing your teeth uh, and then just not taking in processed like sugar food. So that's that. And it says here, research shows that mouthwash kills the oral bacteria needed to produce nitric oxide for up to 12 hours. So literally after you mouthwash and if you mouth wash twice a day, you're killing the bacteria in your mouth all day long. Not ideal. So this leads to a decrease in nitric oxide production and in some instances, an increase in blood pressure. Mouthwash could cause blood pressure. I should probably talk about that on my Friday review. That's outrageous, right? It's crazy. I'm going to actually do that for my Friday review. So uh, I like, again, I love being able to teach what I'm learning as well. So the detrimental effects of mouthwash on nitric oxide production may even contribute to the development of di diabetes, which is characterized by malfunctions in insulin production and action. All right, we don't have to go through all this as well. But another study found that those who use mouthwash at least twice daily were 49% more likely to develop diabetes than those who have never used mouthwash. This is unbelievable. So you know what I'm going to do? There are one, two, three, four, five, six studies on this. I'm going to digest all six of those studies and I'll do a separate show on this and much better alternatives uh, than mouthwash because obviously there are tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of people um, using mouthwash. So mouthwash, wow, it's unbelievable. Uh, so really, really impressed there. What's the moral of the story? Don't use mouthwash, right? <laughs> oil pull instead. You can use sesame oil, organic cold pressed sesame oil, uh, or coconut oil. All right. And the last one I wanted to share with you today, and this is why it's on a training Thursday, is exercise. We overlook exercise in our society because we believe exercise is only for people who want to get in shape and pump up their muscles and all that other stuff. Well, here's the thing. Yes, I can do those things. But exercise is a prerequisite. I'm saying this right now. It's a prerequisite, meaning you have to do it in order to be a healthy individual. You really do. Because exercise helps regulate the immune system. It helps regulate the uptake of nutrients. It sends signals in the cell to stay young and to kill old cells called apoptosis so that you can continue to rejuvenate the body. It, it helps you to produce your own natural antioxidants. It improves circulation, and yes, it improves nitric oxide production. 
So as your body is exercising, ideally with weights, but running also works, sprinting, your body is contracting the muscles and then releasing and relaxing. That constriction of blood and then massive release of blood, like with squats and deadlifts and lunges and these types of things, is absolutely phenomenal at helping with what's called the endothelial tissue. I've just talked about this in the very beginning of the show. We're coming full circle. The endothelial tissue is what's going to allow you to move blood through the extremities, from all the way down to your fingertips and toes, all the way back to your heart. This is so vitally important because all of your cells need nutrition and you need to take the waste away as well through the lymphatic system uh, and then out of your body. So nutrients in, waste out, you can't get that without proper circulation. Now, exercise and regular physical activity um, also helps to prevent, and again, not giving medical advice, I have to say that, high blood pressure, heart disease, and potentially diabetes as well. So how does it do that? Improves endothelial tissue function. Endothelial tissue enables the production of nitric oxide, and the cycle continues. Poor endothelial uh, tissue function, poor nitric oxide production, poor nitric oxide production means hardening of the tissues and poor circulation as well. So it kind of works in all directions. Let me just share with you a study. The benefits of exercise on endothelial health and nitric oxide production can be seen in as little as 10 weeks when exercising for 30 minutes at least three times a week. Again, if you've read The Rain Barrel Effect, if you listen to the Cabral concept long enough, you say, I, you've heard me say three times a week is the minimum, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, all right? So just exercise, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 30 minutes. It could be 20 minutes with weights, 20 minutes of cardio, however you want to do it. 15 minutes with uh, weights, 15 minutes of high-intensity interval training or sprint training, like all of that works. So that includes, though, getting your daily walk in your 10,000 steps a day, minimum of 7,000, about around 10 if you can do it, and then three times a week. If you do this, I'm telling you right now, it is going to give you some of the greatest odds for living not just a long life, but a healthy life, which is really what it's all about as well. Hopefully today's show was helpful. If it was, always feel free to share this show with anyone you believe it can serve, and all of the takeaways and the links will be at stephencabral.com forward slash 2505. Take care, everybody. 